very much. And uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give the talk at this conference. Uh, um, I'm going to tell you a um, story, a little um, work that we have done recently. Uh, so when I prepared this slide, I uh, tried to put, I wanted to put the name of the conference, but the name of our conference is so long, so I put the KITP code for the conference, QBOL DC 22. I don't know what is the, the rule that the KITP put the uh, code for the conference, but the C22 is one of the isotopes that we are going to consider in this talk. Okay, so the reference for this talk is a paper that uh, recently uh, Masaru Hongo, uh, who is now in Niigata University in Japan, and I um, wrote um, in the beginning of this year. So the plan of my talk is to first uh, tell you about two neutrons, uh, halo nuclei, boromian, what we call boromian halo nuclei, and then discuss uh, a very important feature in neutron interactions that neutrons are almost particle near unitarity. Uh, and that discussion, there is a little bit of uh, um, important um, theoretical aspect of this uh, neutrons that I want to emphasize um, related to scale invariance in, um, in, in field theory. And then we are going to see how this uh, notion of dimension of operators uh, can help us to understand the coupling of these two neutrons with the core in the halo nucleus and uh, enable us to write down a very nice effective field theory that describes these halo nuclei. And then we are going to uh, compute um, several physical quantities. So the two uh, halo, um, the, the two neutron halo nuclei um, are the objects that can be visualized as a core. Uh, so in this talk, I will call the mass of this core or the, uh, the, the atomic number A and two nuclei that are relatively far away from this core. The core is considered as a compact object and then the two nuclei are relatively far away. And these objects um, typically exist near the neutron drip, drip line. And uh, one feature of that is that if you take the core and then add one neutron, then one doesn't get a bound a nucleus. The system is unbound, but with two additional nuclei or neutrons, we get a bound a nucleus. Examples of these two neutron halo nuclei are helium-6, uh, probably the most well-known example, but then we also have helium-8, lithium-11, and then this um, interesting uh, newest isotope carbon-22. These nuclei are called boromian because um, any subsystem of two particles are unbound. Two neutrons do not form bound state, a core and a neutron do, uh, do not form bound state. In this uh, system, there are, one can see two small energy scales. One energy comes from the large scattering length between two neutrons. In, the, in nature, somehow, we are living in a rather fine-tuned world where the scattering length between two neutrons is much larger than the range of the interaction, 11, uh, 19 Fermi, which corresponds to an energy scale of about 0 0.12 MeV. The second energy, the second energy scale is the binding energy of the three-body system core, neutron, neutron, or this is, um, also called the two neutron separation energy. For helium-6, that value is about one MeV. For lithium-11, about 0 0.37 MeV. And for carbon-22, we don't know exactly the value, but there are indications that uh, the binding energy of carbon-22 can be pretty small, smaller than any of these values, maybe smaller than 0 0.18 MeV. So the problem here is, uh, the problem where there seems to be two small energy scale, which are small compared to a more typical energy scale that one can get, for example, by looking at the range, uh, an effective range of the interaction. Say between two, two neutrons, the effective range is 2.75 Fermi. 
which correspond to an energy of about five MeV. So these both, both these energy scale are much less than a few MeV. That is the more typical energy scale of nuclear interaction. So um, this nuclei, this nuclei um, halo nuclei, sometimes uh, have been looked at by theorists as example. It's possible possible places where the Efimov effect can occur. So when the neutron and the core scatter with the large scattering length, then it is guaranteed that the Efimov effect uh, appears. There are bound states. Um, the closer we are into to the ideal like of effect, the more bound state we have. Um, but for this talk, I want to emphasize that three body bound state can exist even without the of effect. So let's try to think what would happen along a line where um, the value that runs along the line is the strength of the attraction between the core and the neutron. At some value of the attraction, we should have, at some critical value, we would have a core and neutron bound state, an S wave bound state of a core and a neutron. And at that point, the scattering length between the core and the neutron diverges. And this is where the Efimov effect appears. And a lot of theory, theoretical work have been done uh, concentrating on this regime. On the other hand, there should be another value, smaller value, at which the three body bound state appear. It's smaller because the neutron by themselves, they are already, already in, uh, attract each other. So we just need a little bit more. We, we don't need to bind the two body state in order to form a three body bound state. Actually, there is a, one can do a simple variational calculation to see that actually where the three body state appears the scattering between the core and the neutron do not have to have a large scattering length. It can have a scattering length that can be comparable to the uh, range of interaction. And so here is the regime where the uh, halo nucleus have a small binding energy that grows from zero, grows up a little bit uh, to here. And when you clo go close to here, the binding energy becomes comparable to the um, it will be determined by the cutoff, basically. As in the Efimov effect, the lowest state has an energy that is determined by the cutoff. We are going to concentrate our attention to this regime of uh, weakly bound halo nucleus, where the strength of the attraction between the core and the neutron is just enough, slightly more than enough to bind the three body bound state. So, what the question is, what happened there? Can we? Uh, make use of the two small parameters that we have to, buy, to, to, to build a theory. Okay, so let me um, tell you just a little bit, or almost all I know about carbon-22. Uh, so we know that this uh, carbon-22 has a structure of a core, which is carbon-20 and the neutrons. The scattering length between the neutron and the, and the core um, is claimed to be small, uh, less than 2.8 Fermi by one experiment. And so clearly this system cannot be a, a, a theme of state. The scattering length is so small between the core and the neutron. Uh, the matter radius has been measured to be quite large. I'm not going to quote the number here, but uh, from this uh, one can get, a, with some theoretical input, one can get a uh, upper bound on the binding energy is at 0 0.18 MeV that I've mentioned in one of the previous transparencies. <coughs> so this is one of the case uh, where we want to build our effective field theory. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about the uh, neutron at unitarity, but uh, let me give, uh, uh, draw your attention on a paper by Zeldovich in 1960s, probably the first uh, paper where um, the notions of fermions at unitarity has been presented in a very clear way. So, you know which, uh, so the paper actually was uh, written in 1959, 
uh, he was looking at neutron rich possibility of neutron rich nuclei, but then he also asked the question about the possibility of this exist, existence of heavy nuclei composed of neutrons only, like this tetra neutron that we are going to discuss later. Uh, the problem is reduced to a Fermi gas with resonant interaction. Notice how, how modern the terminology is. We are all now talking about Fermi gas with resonant interaction. The energy of this gas is proportional to omega equal to third, where omega is density. So it's it's thinking about a fixed number of neutrons, compress it to the density omega, and the energy is omega to the power of two thirds. That's Yeldovich, 1959. And the accuracy of the calculation not sufficient to determine the sign of the energy. He couldn't uh, determine, he couldn't say whether the system become unstable or like the FIMOP effect that we, for bosons that is unstable or it's unstable. But this, I find this probably is the first uh, discussion of the unitarity regime. Okay, so let's return to neutrons of unitarity. So first, now we, um, I'm, my, my transparency is going to be more um, uh, a few theoretical. Uh, uh, the neutrons are described by uh, fermionic field psi with the contact interaction. And one trick to deal with this uh, theory is to introduce an auxiliary field, D, B stay for dimer, uh, and this dimer can uh, split into uh, neutron with spin up, neutron with spin down, and the, uh, uh, we rewrite this, uh, have rewritten this interaction using the Hubbard Stratonovich trick. Now, the, um, and the calculation of the scattering between two neutrons reduces to the computation of the full propagator of this dimer that comes from the self-energy correction to the dimer propagator, one loop correction. And this one loop correction is a uh, um, uh, diverging integral, uh, linearly divergent. So the, uh, it depends on the cutoff and it uh, has a finite part. The, once the cutoff is single out, the rest is finite. And the inverse propagator of the dimer is the, um, so the sum of the bare propag inverse propagator, the cutoff, and that finite piece. And unitarity corresponds to fine-tuning the, uh, the, the bare coupling uh, to cancel the cutoff in the one-loop graph. So the at the fine-tune um, point, uh, the propagator is simply this part. It's written here. Uh, in, uh, large scattering length means uh, slightly non-cancellation uh, between these two parts. And physically that corresponds to a fine tuning of the interaction between two neutrons. There is an elementary exercise in quantum field theory that one go almost at the beginning of the course, that is the, uh, uh, the, the, the determination of the dimension of operators. So in our non-relativistic field theory, uh, we have to count time as twice space because Omega is equal to P squared. And so the dimension of the operator psi is three half, momentum to the power of three half. And this is consistent with the form of the propagator. I forgot the decker here, the propagator of a scalar field, non-relativistic free field is one over T to the power of three half times some exponent. But now we have this dimer operator, which uh, in the unitarity regime has propagator that is one divided by square root. So it's not a free field. Uh, uh, the uh, propagator of that field is one over T squared times the exponent. And if one uh, assign, then what, well, this, this should be D, I'm sorry. This D operator should have a dimension that is equal to two, the dimer operator of dimer in our theory has dimension that is not equal to the sum of dimension of the two neutron. Although it looks like it, it, it's a dimer, but it's two neutron, the dimension, you add it up, we get three instead of two. The interaction, unitary interaction between two neutrons in the field theory reduces the dimension of the operator from three to two. And this is a simplest example of, uh, uh, of what is called I, I call, uh, we call a nucleus and 
uh, I refer to uh, Eric's talk later in this conference for um, the discussion of the notion of unnucleus. Now we want to build the theory of the weakly bound halo nuclei. So we have neutrons, we know how to describe it. Now we have to add to the theory of the core. Why? That's an independent degree of freedom in the theory. But there is one more step. We have to add the halo nucleus as an independent degree of freedom in the theory. And the reason is that effective field theory is supposed to capture all low energy degrees of freedom. The halo nucleus is weakly bound, so it's low energy degree of freedom. And we have to add it as an independent degree of freedom. After this, there is one interaction term that one can write down. It's H dagger D phi plus Hermitian conjugate. We say that the halo nucleus can decompose, can, can, can split into a core and a dineutron. That term, if one now count the dimension, is three half for the halo, three half for the core, and two for the dimer. And the dimension is five. And remember that this is the dimension of a marginal operator. And so in the field theory, we have a marginal. The first interaction is marginal and the effective field theory is renormalizable. So here is the full uh, effective Lagrangian. There is a core term, there is a halo with the binding energy, and there is a splitting, a halo can split into a, a core and a dimer, and then the rest is this um, uh, uh, Lagrangian interact of the uh, unitary um, uh, interacting neutrons. This theory is almost, if you look at that, almost scale invariant for the following reason. The, uh, the, the only things that I mentioned full here are the, uh, the uh, C0, the scattering length. If the scattering length of um, these not infinite, of, of, of neutrons not infinite, then scaling variance is broken. It's also broken by the small binding energy of the, uh, hey, uh, hey, uh, of the halo. But there is another uh, more theoretically more interesting uh, phenomenon that uh, comes out. There is a logarithmic running of this coupling. This coupling is dimensionless, like the charge in QED. And it runs logarithmically a scale just like the charge in QED. It goes to zero in the infrared and it will go formally to the UV, it has a Landau pole. So let me show you how, where it comes from. So uh, one of the diagrams one has to compute is the self energy of the halo. Halo decomposed into a core and a dineutron. And the self energy that is written here, if one compute, we see that it's a quadratically divergent. So quadratic divergent has to be canceled. At least most of that has to be canceled by the bare term that we put in so that the binding energy is a halo becomes small. So that there's one more fine tuning we have to make, the fine tuning of this term to cancel out the, uh, the, this divergent. The binding energy is fine tuned to almost zero. And then, after the quadratic divergence is canceled, there is a remaining logarithmic divergence that leads to the renormalization, wave function renormalization of the halo. Or if one rescale the halo field, it becomes a logarithmic, logarithmic running of the coupling constant. That's why the coupling constant runs logarithmically. Okay, so, but this theory is very well defined, very, um, it's, uh, very easy to, uh, to, to work with. Uh, one can compute a lot of things. So we have computed at least three, we have computed three physical quantities. The first is the charge radius of the halo nucleus. So uh, we imagine that we couple photon to that uh, object, the halo nucleus, and measure the form factor. The form factor near zero momentum uh, give us the charge radius. So the Feynman diagram that we need to, comp to compute is this one, where the photon is coupled to the core. Only the core is charged, carries charge, and the, the, this dimer doesn't carry charge. So the, the, the diagram actually is conversion. Uh, so we have the charge radius equal to some uh, trivial function dependent on the atomic number of the core. So G squared, because there are two interactions a vertex here divided by B times some function of the 
dimensionless ratio. What is the ratio? The ratio between two energy scales that I've mentioned in the beginning, the neutron for virtual energy scale, 0 0.12 MeV, and the binding energy of a halo nucleus. Now, if you look at this for, uh, formula, it's almost, um, it shows that the physics of this halo nucleus is almost universal. Almost universal in the same sense as the S wave resonance is universal. The only thing that is different, so everything depends only on the, on the binding energy and the ratio, dimensionless ratio of two energy scale. The only thing that is different is that there is a coupling constant G here. Actually, the coupling constant is in a certain renormalization scale, uh, in a scheme at the, on the on-shell renormalization scheme. So uh, knowing experimentally the, num the, the binding energy of the halo nucleus and the uh, neutron scattering length, we would not be able to predict the charge radius because there is one more fact, one more unknown here, the, the coupling constant G. However, if we know this G, we can, can, we can use it to compute another radius, the, the matter radius. So the matter radius turn out to be given uh, the, uh, by almost the same formula, except this function, dimensionless function here, is a little bit different. But all, is com all, all but Feynman diagram can be calculated analytically. And the ratio between the matter radius and the charge radius does not contain the coupling constant G anymore. And it is a universal function of the ray, except this factor, that is the mass of the core, we have just a ratio of two function of the uh, ratio of uh, two uh, mass uh, to energy scale. So in uh, so here uh, in the limit where B is much larger than epsilon n, when the binding energy much much less much much larger than 0 0.12 MeV, this ratio is two two thirds of A. So that is one of the uh, prediction to leading order in this effective field theory. We can predicts the ratio of the mass in the charge radii. Another thing that one can compute is the, I, um, the, 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 uh, the, the dipole strength function. So the definition of this is, the, is written here. Uh, this definition, uh, the definition uh, can be, um, we, can, we can use the, uh, the, um, the fact that the derivative of the coordinate is a velocity to uh, rewrite this formula, rewriting the dipole uh, strength function to the imaginary part of certain uh, uh, current current correlate current current uh, correlator, uh, evaluated uh, in the state one one a state of one halo nucleus. So J J uh, sandwich between a one particle state of halo nucleus. So those who have studied QCD recognize that this is the, the, the same thing that appear in deep inelastic scattering. And the calculation becomes very similar to the calculation of uh, uh, the diagram, at least looks like the diagram for deep inelastic scattering on a halo nucleus. So it doesn't have to be deep. Here the, 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 the momentum, the energy of the photon can be anything. It's coupled to this new, uh, to the core, and the imaginary part of this green function obtained when we cut this diagram in the middle. So the calculation again uh, follows very well-defined rule of um, field theory, and we get explicit result, very explicit form of the um, uh, dipole strand function, which, if I plot it, uh, looks like it gives us a very characteristic peak the same type of peak that one see experimentally, for example, in uh, helium, helium four. We have not tried to really fit this data because we, we uh, because at this, at this level, I think uh, we, uh, we hope to reproduce, uh, to, to reproduce the, the uh, result uh, quantitatively, probably a next correction needs to be calculated. But we have checked that this formula satisfy all the uh, some rule that one expects for the E1 uh, dipole function. Um, um, if we integrate this complicated function over omega, we get the like the charge radius, which we have uh, computed using a completely different uh, Feynman diagram. 
the correction to the EFT are uh, in the irrelevant terms in the effective field theory that uh, the, there are only two that uh, that appear with uh, dimension six. So the effective range of NN scattering and the S wave scattering between the core and the neutron. Using the experimental upper bound on the neutron carbon 20 scattering length, uh, we have estimated the, that the effect of this term to be less than 25%. But that's assuming all the numerical coefficients are small. A P wave core neutron resonance, like in the helium 5, can also be included yeah, thank you. In, the, uh, uh, in, can, uh, in the calculation. Basically, we have to introduce a new field uh, that correspond to that resonance, write down all the coupling to other fields because it's P wave. Uh, the coupling constant, the, the, the coupling is has more has is more irrelevant and one can see that the core neutron resonance in p wave can be incorporated within this effective field theory and does not destroy the uh, the power counting of the effective field theory okay so uh let me conclude um my talk uh weekly bound two neutron halo nuclei uh I, um, at least uh, i i I find them to be a very simple object, uh, almost as simple as a, a, a neutron from the point of view of effective field theory. Almost everything can be calculated, almost uh, and everything can be calculated analytically. Um, a feature of this theory is that there is a logarithmic running of the coupling. Um, so quantity that are computed uh, do not no, normally depends only on the energy, the binding energy or the, uh, the um, neutron scattering length. In contrast to, for example, uh, a shallow uh, S-wave bound state where everything, almost everything is dependent only on the binding energy. But if you take ratio of uh, length scale, ratio of, for example, the charge radius and the matter radius, get something that is universal, at least to leading order in this effective field theory. The next calculation we want to do is to incorporate the NN scattering length correction, and that's relatively easy. And we are, have almost uh, done the calculations. And for the, um, some, for the quantity that we look at, the uh, correction isn't, uh, la numerically is not, la is not large. Uh, another uh, correction that is um, more difficult to incorporate is the scattering between core and a neutron. Uh, what we just need to compute a three loop graph and then we will know the value of that correction. Or the P wave resonance that also required computation of a three loop graph. But everything in this uh, theory is uh, well defined and can be calculated. Uh, technically in a rather simple way. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the nice talk. So questions, please. Yes, please. Okay. Yes. Um, this effective theory should this equally well apply to three neutrons and the, and the core. Is there anything in interesting there or is it is it um, is the third neutron trivial? Three or four neutron in the core um, in principle, but the calculation will be more um, okay. complicated. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's when there are more than two neutrons, then the uh, you know that the diagram start to instead of one single diagram, you start to have an infinite number of mm -hmm. graphs. And uh, but but in principle. Um, okay, but I and don't know any possible place where um, any nucleus where that can be applied. Where the third neutron is yeah. found? Yeah, with a low binding energy, with a small uh -huh. binding energy. And um, of all the nucle nuclei near the drip line, is, is this a very special case with very few examples? Are, are most most uh, halo nuclei near this Ephemovian? point rather than near the? I think they are uh, probably um, 
if I have to guess, they are probably equally distributed along this point. And, um, and we, uh, we, if we go further in we explore heavier nuclei, probably we will find more examples around this point. Other questions? Yes, please. Uh, so yeah, this is the diagram I wanted to ask you about. So um, this would be an example of a light, light, heavy FMOV effect, right? Two very light particles and one heavy particle, which you said is always there. And that technically that's true if you go to unitarity. But uh, I mean, we studied uh, like in our 2012 physical review letter with uh, Jose was a co-author um, that the light, light, heavy FMOV effect is extremely unfavored. We call this the unfavored scenario. And at least in the cases we looked at, you would have to go to something like 10 to the four times the effective range before you would see a bound, the first bound state, the first FMOV state becoming yeah. bound. Mm -hmm. So essentially for the neutron, neutron heavy scenarios, you'll probably never in nuclei see an FMOV state. Yeah, probably the, the, the size of this uh, region is actually smaller than what I drawn, tried mm -hmm. to draw here. It's ex extremely it's unlikely, really yeah. Small. But the size of this one probably is of order one. So we we should expect some. Yeah, no, that 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 should be very physical yeah. and uh, expected to be seen. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, Giuseppino. Okay. Okay. First. Okay. So uh, you gave an example of the carbon thirty one system where the correction from the neutron core scattering length. Uh, Produces an uncertainty of about 25% in your calculation. Mm -hmm. So, is that a representative scenario? Uh, what happens when you try other nuclei? Do you get larger uncertainties from the neutron core scattering lens? So, this 25% is um, the upper bound. Uh, we, we use the upper bound on the on the um, A and the, uh, the, the 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 neutrons carbon 20 uh, scattering lens. Actually, the experiment claim that their result consistent with zero. But, so yeah. which experiment would that be? This is, um, I forget, I All right. think, yeah. So uh, the question is, is that representative for other systems like lithium-11, boron-19, lithium-6? Lithium-11, I'm, I'm not sure about um, this um, uh, because uh, there, is, there is a resonance in lithium-10, but, I don't know the. Uh, so the do you the, know the quantum? The, the, there's the also quantum S wave. Number. Yeah, there's also S wave virtual state and and also resonance, right? So if it is a wave yeah. resonance and an S wave virtual state. If it is a resonance, yeah. so our theory would break down if the scattering length is too large, uh, because the uh, uh, and I. I think it's something of order one, but I, I I've done this estimate only once, so I haven't yeah. looked okay. at that for the alpha alpha m. Uh, I think there's it, it's probably uh, I don't I, I, I cannot recall the um, the alpha n scattering length if anyone can yeah. tell me the so, alpha n scattering length it's yeah. going to be what worries me is that uh, this scenario where the neutron core scattering length is also large seems to be more common right yeah alpha and n scattering length is not large so yeah, in your calculation they aren't, but but uh, that seems to be the more uh, common scenario. No, if you the, look at the, say how, helium six, for example. Uh, the, the 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 what is? Can anybody? Say? I seem to recall that the S wave scattering length between an alpha particle and the neutron is not large. Oh yes, uh, helium six. Yeah, yeah. No, so, no, no, it isn't. You're right. So there's a P wave resonance, right? It's a so P wave, wave resonance. S wave is not large. But P yeah, wave resonance sense. is something that does not destroy the um, the, um, the the calculation. So yeah. Yeah. I have we ha we haven't estimated the, the correction, but 
from the power counting, it should be small. Right? The correction Thank should you. be small. So there are further questions. So let's start with Giuseppina. I guess uh, you can calculate uh, the dipole polarizability. Can you not? Dipole polarizability. Yes. You have the BE1, okay? Yes. You have uh, the old form. You, you could, uh, you could uh, get the dipole polarizability. That would that be very interesting, observable to, to give in a close form. Yeah, I yeah. think we can. Uh, it's some because you you said that you have the BE1. Yeah, I have the full full. Okay. The full and, uh, omega. It's yeah. enough to inverse energy weight, and then uh -huh. it's equivalent to the dipole polarizability. Okay, or you can uh, use uh, the uh, current current imaginary part of the current current and make uh, an expansion for low omega. That's the same. That that could I be think, yeah. very interesting. Probably uh, it's some integral of this function yes, yes. envelope. Inverse something. energy. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think we can do that. Okay, there was Mia. Could you go back to the effect of Lagrangian? So you you introduced this dimer um, field, um, but without any kinetic term. But then you for the you introduced the halo field with a kinetic term. And can you just say briefly? why the halo field is treated so differently from the dimer field? So here, um, physically, what happened is that the dimer field is not a free particle. It's a unnucleus in our language. And so the kinetic term for D has dimension six, D, D, T, D, N, it is irrelevant. That has to be treated as a correction to the main result. And that can be included rather simply to, in all these calculations. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering, uh, in this uh, dipole uh, transition, um, if there is a very strong resonance, neutron core resonance, what would be the impact on uh, the result? If there is a large S wave scattering. P wave. Oh, P, P wave. wave. Like the helium 6. Helium 6, there is a resonance between, uh, helium 5 is a resonance between the neutron and the alpha. It's a P wave resonance, mm -hmm. right? So I guess that the cross section for the dipole uh, uh, disintegration of uh, helium 6 is very sensitive, should be very sensitive to this resonance. So how will this impact your theory? Can I, 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 from the field theory that I wrote, I think it should not be sensitive, uh, at least in the uh, to, in this power in the power counting scheme that we have this uh, in the in the ideal world, in the idealized world, this existence of this P wave resonance should give a subdominant correction to all the physical quantity, including the the uh, this dipole strand. Thanks. Uh, hey, Son, uh, I mean, it, it, Halo EFT has been around for a long time and people like Hans Helmer have looked at uh, carbon 22, for example. Could you contrast your results with his? Could I contrast the result? I yeah, think our I mean, result in which way is what you are doing is different from what he did before? I have never done the. Uh, no, no, no. Carbon UFI, 22. But when I, if I look at the, um, what, have been done before, um, there has never been a well-defined uh, regime of uh, universality. That is, um, for example, um, the ratio between the two length scale. Uh, um, in the result that has been presented before, there was always a large band of error that depends on precisely how one, do, one does the cutoff. So I'm not sure in if that's... In Halo EFT? 
in in the in yeah in the in their cal in most calculations that I've seen take before there is um, the, the 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 problem with the um, previous approach I think is also that the assumption of that we can really replace the core and neutron interaction by 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 the scattering lamp and that scattering lamp has to be large in order for uh, for the, um, the the calculation to be valid that is there is a hierarchy between the core neutron scattering length and core neutron effective range and that if there is no hierarchy between these two scales then then there is no then we don't know what i think the previous approach and and are not um, not applicable. That said, I'm not. I haven't studied this um, this work very carefully. Um, it's a naive question I have. I mean, uh, this model. If we think on the wave function of this, uh, ray, I mean, core and two neutrons, can we think as a two-body model where you have the wave function of the d neutron let us say with respect to the to the core times uh, some wave function of the d neutron can because when i look to the diagram naively this is the image came yeah. to my mind i just uh -huh. want to check if this make uh, correspondence or not yeah so one can look at this problem from the two using the um the 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 the, the um, Jacobi coordinate. So the wave function is a function of the distance between the two neutron and the uh, core to the center of mass. When the when the uh, when the um, potentially short range, this this equation can be solved the same way as if you move solved the problem. And one see the following: that in the limit where the uh, neutrons are at unitarity. Uh, the wave function has a form like one over r cube, where r is a hyper radius. The form where the uh, the, the normalization integral for the uh, wave function is logarithmic, so it's like integral of dr r to the phi divided by r to the six, something like that. So that is the wave function uh, um, and wave function uh, equivalence of the running of the coupling, basically. This is logarithmic. Uh, integral the in, the integration of the normalization of wave function is logarithmic divergent, but the radii, for example, the charge or the the matter radii, they are all in, involving integrals that are that convergent. So that's that's why we get universal result for the charge in the matter radii. Last question, Alejandro. It has been a while. Uh, a question on the self-energy of a, a halo field. Yeah. Uh, you said that you do kind of fine tuning. Is this, this equivalent to adding a free body force on the system? So um, in the effective field theory, we are um, oblivious to the nature, microscopic nature of, uh, of what binds the three body um, three bodies. State. It could be microscopically, it could be just two body core neutron attraction. We know that under renormalization group, the three body force can be can emerge from two body uh, state by integrating out the uh, half degrees of freedom in the internal line. And so three body shallow bound state can appear without uh, three body force. And one can write down simple, uh, simplest, um, simplest uh, example would be two a couple, two um, unitary interacting fermion in a Gaussian potential. And one can adjust the strength of the Gaussian integral uh, potential so that this there is a three body bound state. Okay, Alejandro, your question is short. Well, it could be. <laughs> uh, if you have your parameters in your Lagrangian, which are there, the epsilon n and the b, you can describe this parameter using a potential, 
and then study the same things that you study using the potential. So what do you think this, uh, for example, these universal relations varying the, the parameter of the potential, for example, the Gaussian between two neutrons, the three body force between the core and the two neutrons, and all these properties can be studied using potential models. In principle, I think so. The, the effective field theory approach uh, uh, simply emphasize which part of the results are independent of the shape of the potential. So Gaussian potential or some more complicated potential, if the value of the energy and the uh, scattering length between neutrons are the same, then we get the same uh, ratio. Yes. Okay, let's thank our speaker. Thank you.